Welcome back to my animal education series. Today we're here at Zoo Atlanta with Rebecca. Hello. Hey Cole, how are you? I'm good. So what birds are we talking about today? Today we're talking about the Northern or Abyssinian ground hornbill. Where can you find these birds out in the wild? These guys come from kind of the sub-Saharan Africa area, so Northern Africa. There's another species called a Southern ground hornbill that's found in Southern Africa. What are the differences in between the two? So they pretty much look, pre they're pretty similar. Um, northern ground hornbills are a little bigger. Southern ground hornbills, a little bit smaller. Um, but natural history wise, what they eat, what they do, it's pretty similar. And what do these birds eat? <laughs> they eat everything. <laughs> so they're omnivores. Uh, they typically are looking for meat items, but they will eat vegetation as well. Um, one of the really cool things about uh, ground hornbills is they have a near immunity to snake venom. So they'll actually eat venomous snakes and they can get bit once or twice, no big deal. Well, that's pretty neat because I imagine there's quite a bit of venomous snakes in Africa. Correct. And what kind of uh, snakes are there? Because I don't exactly remember all of those snakes <laughs> off the top of my head. That's a great question, of course. Um, I'm not sure what exactly snakes live in the same area as, as they do, but there are quite a few venomous snakes in Africa that, that they can grab a hold of. What kind of animals would try to eat a hornbill? Uh, that's a great question. So when they're full grown, you know, they stand about this tall. There's not too many animals that might go after it, but if they're laying out sunning, a lion might go ahead and try and get them. Pretty much any of the predators, those big um, African predators out there are going to try to get them. So they sleep in trees, they roost up high, and that's not going to save them from a leopard that's going to be able to hunt in the tree, but it keeps them off the ground and a little bit safer. Because they're not exactly a small bird either. <laughs> no, they're pretty big. And a lot of people know that birds have hollow bones, so even though the bird's about yay high, how much do these birds weigh? So he weighs um, about four kilograms, and I am not good at math, so I'm not going to convert that to pounds, but you guys I'm not good at math either, so we're going to... <laughs> it's four kilograms, we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> so there is some sexual dimorphism in this species. What are the main differences between the females and the males? So the big difference is the color of their throat pouch. In the northern ground hornbill, they're blue and red for the males. And in the southern ground hornbills, the females have the blue and red. So scientists have no idea why that's how they adapted, but that's what happened. And hey, we had a male out here just now with the blue and the red, correct? Correct. Yeah, I don't know how uh, good my shots of it, or uh, he was filming from the left side, he asked him from the right side. Um, so I'm just hoping that at least some of our footage can show that off right. But you do have uh, some females on exhibit as well. Yeah, so on Habitat we have a male and female southern ground hornbill, a little bit right. smaller guys. Um, but yeah, I think you guys got some footage of them running around. So you'll see their names are Zazu and Gumby. Zazu's the female and Gumby's the male. What I understand with these hornbills is that they have a really unique nesting behavior. Uh, it's kind of difficult for me to explain really quickly, but can you explain it for me? Yeah, sure. So when hornbills nest, um, the female will find a tree cavity or excavate a tree cavity. She'll go into the tree cavity. The male will then mud her in. So he'll find mud and he will seal the tree cavity. So he'll basically lock her in the tree and leave a hole, in which case his beak can fit in. So he is entirely responsible for feeding her and any subsequent chicks for the duration of, her, of that um, nesting period with those chicks. And it gets really tight in that nesting cavity when that chick is ready to fledge before the female will break them out of the nesting cavity. Um, it's, it's pretty hilarious when you see footage of nests in there. They're like squeezed in like little sardines in a can. Have you guys had any breeding success here at the zoo with them? We have had some breeding success. So our um, southern ground hornbills are, are, are what we would call a younger pair as far as breeding goes. Um, so it takes a lot of practice for them to get it right. So they've had a couple of um, chicks. Unfortunately, we haven't had any surviving chicks here, but that's not unusual. Given birds, um, they have a long learning history, and so they have to really learn how to sit on a nest. They have to learn how to rear that chick properly. They have to learn how to feed each other properly. And um, we have had quite a bit of success with our reef hornbills, and hopefully soon with our rhinoceros hornbills as well. And since you mentioned some of the other hornbill species, what are some of the main differences in between the ground hornbill and other hornbill species? Yeah, so there's the two ground hornbill species and then lots of other flighted hornbills that are safe. Most of their, spend almost all their time in the trees. Um, they come, they're um, bountiful in Asia and Africa. Um, and there are a lot of different um, aerial hornbills. They come from the smallest, small guy like a Vonderdecken's hornbill that's only this big to the rhinoceros hornbill that's like this big. Because I've seen a couple of uh, rhinoceros, rhinoceros hornbills before, and they are really impressive animals. Very. 
So these birds spend a lot of their time on the ground, and you mentioned that they go up and roost in the trees. So what exactly is like the daily life for these birds? Where like what all are they doing on the ground? Yeah, so they're hanging out in a big group. They're very social or gregarious birds. Um, so they're hanging out and they're basically using that long beak to swish through the grasses and look for insects, snakes. They'll even pound into tortoise shells that they find with that strong beak. Um, and so they're mostly spending their day foraging through the grasslands of Africa. They'll also spend a lot of time sunning. Um, people frequently see our birds on habitat and ask, are they okay? Because when they sun, they just kind of pancake out. Their wings will go out to the side, their head will lay sideways, and they leave. when you see them, you're like, whoa, that bird, something's wrong with that bird, but he's just enjoying the sun. Yeah, if, if, uh, I probably would have thought the same thing, but if people like don't know a whole lot about birds, or horn, hornbills specifically, they just see a bird laying out, probably doesn't look the most healthy, it's just laying down. Exactly. Especially when a lot of people think of birds being up in the trees right. and here he's laying on the ground. Right. But how, like let's get into the animals that we have here at the zoo. Uh, how old are the birds that you have here? So Abby is about 21 years old, which sounds old, but he actually hopefully will live to be 40 or 45 years old. Um, so he's probably middle-aged. Um, these ground hornbills will stay with their parents for almost 10 years. Wow. That's and they don't time. reach maturity till they're about 14. So um, these, they, they're very long-lived birds and, and they do have a very long life history. And you mentioned that uh, you have a younger couple of the southern hornbills as well. Yeah, so they're also in their near early 20s. So for a breeding pair, that's still relatively young for them. That's crazy to think about because I just, a lot of um, wild animal species have shorter lifespans, so they have to kind of breed really quickly after their uh, sexual maturity. Yep. And one of the first animals that comes to mind is the possum. There's a <laughs> super short lifespan, has to uh, <laughs> breed almost immediately to have any chance of breeding before it passes away. That's right. And I always forget that there's a lot of bird species that live a very long time. Very long time, yeah. So even our owls, um, our, our milky eagle owls that we have here can live to be 50 um, or even older than that. Wow, that, that just still blows my mind because I think of like little <laughs> songbirds and I always forget that these are really big birds that live a whole lot longer. Yeah. But are these birds in any part of like SSP program or anything like that? Yeah, so an SSP program is like a breeding consortium through accredited zoos. So we send animals from one zoo to another or we might send chicks from one zoo to another to make sure that our genetic diversity within the zoo stays nice and healthy. So both the northern ground hornbill and southern ground hornbill are part of an SSP program. So what that means is there's one person who's responsible for making sure their genetic diversity stays nice and healthy for generations to come. So where did your hornbills come from? Did they come from another zoo or were they rescues? They all came from other zoos. Um, Abby was came here when he was just uh, probably about a year old. So he's actually been here at the zoo for about 20 years. Um, and Zazu and Gumby came here when they were um, youngish as well. They've been here for quite a while. And you mentioned the bird show and that's where we're doing this interview right now. Um, so what makes the ground hornbill such a good education and ambassador animal? That's a great question. So what we try to um, do for our ambassador birds here in the presentation is have a diversity of species, but also species with a rich history of being ambassador animals. We know those animals get along really well and enjoy human contact or appear to enjoy human contact. So Abby really seems to cherish his time with his keepers. He likes scratches from us. Um, he likes to sh try to share food with us, although I'm not going to take Mises pieces from him, but he tries to offer them to me. Um, and so we try to choose species that we know have adapted well um, to being in close proximity with people. Yeah, because obviously you don't want an animal that's come out here from like a generation of really nice animals and then he's, re he's really mean or, I, I hate using that word to describe an animal, but it's not comfortable in the situation. Like it could be a lot of really nice ones, but you have to make sure that animals good around the public. Yeah, so that's actually a really good point. So we not only choose species as ambassadors, but individuals. So we'll either get them when they're very young um, so that we can really kind of in, um, expose them to as many different things as we can so that they like see tall people and short people and people in um, scooters or um, people with hats on or like umbrellas, different color, clothing. different color clothing. So if we get them when they're young, we can expose them to all that stuff. Otherwise, we actually pick out um, individuals. So for example, like our rabbits that are in our education program are rescues. Mm -hmm. So we actually go to the rabbit rescue and pick out individuals that seem appropriate for our program. What is the IUCN status for these birds? 
So these guys are listed as vulnerable. Um, so what that means is they do have threats to their habitat or their species and their population numbers unfortunately are decreasing. That's primarily due to habitat loss. Um, as people, as populations grow and people encroach on new, new spaces, they're unfortunately cutting down um, and building on spaces that would be for groundhorn bills. Yeah, unfortunately, that's a really common story with a lot of uh, wildlife. A deforestation and uh, habitat loss is devastating to a lot of animals. Yeah. It's just a, every once in a while on the channel, I'll get an animal that's least concerned. And uh, I always do a little fist pump to myself. <laughs> like, there's one more animal that's doing all right out there. But yeah. unfortunately, there are a lot of animals that aren't doing as great as others. There are, and we can help even by doing simple things like when you buy furniture, mm -hmm. um, just checking where that wood came from and did it come from a sustainable location. And also even something like not throwing your old furniture out, but donating it or reselling it so that someone else isn't buying some brand new wood from something else. So um, things like shade grown coffee, really easy things that we can do to kind of encourage people to leave forests intact. How long have you been working here at Zoo Atlanta with the Ambassador Animal Program? So I've been here about 11 years. Um, before that, I was working for a, a bird bird presentation company that kind of did bird presentations around the country. Um, and I've worked in a number of other facilities before here. And I actually started because my dad owns a pet store. And um, so I've grown up around animals. I've been working on animals my whole life. <laughs> well, thank you so much for telling us about the ground hornbill. You're it, welcome. It was a species I didn't know a whole lot about, so when I was doing my research, I just wanted to do a little bit so that you can give me a lot of uh, more information than Wikipedia can give me. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I've enjoyed my time with you. I enjoyed my time with you as well, because you are very knowledgeable on all these animals here. Thank you. And thank you guys so much for watching this week's video. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and as always, I'll see you next week.